Hello and welcome to Showcase. Today, we're looking to break Hollywood tropes, rediscover what made Da Vinci so great, and check out some pricey Christmas stocking stuffers. Inside my head's an even bigger mess. I can't stop twisting things around, words and sounds especially. Have to keep playing with them until they come out right. We ask if Edward Norton can revive a fading film noir genre. The most expensive exhibition of Leonardo da Vinci's work opens up at the Louvre. And auction season is underway in New York. When director Ken Loach first started out, his documentary for a charity was so disliked by the backers that they literally tried to destroy the film. Yet, later in his career, Loach became one of the strongest voices in politically charged fiction film. He has made a name for himself for bringing to the headlines the problems faced by the British working class. And in his latest offering, Sorry We Missed You, the director tackles austerity in England. All right, all right, listen, just doing the job. <laughs> is not going to be good enough in the future. Right? Inspired by the You've social realist well. British movies of the 1960s, director Ken Loach, in a bold move, took it upon himself to carry the style of filmmaking to the next level, which meant harsher criticism of the government and a more sophisticated portrayal of the underrepresented classes. Concrete in, plumbing. With Sorry We Missed You, Loach takes a look back at the 2008 financial crisis from the rare point of view of an economically struggling English family, where Ricky, Abby and their family try to get out from under a disastrous cycle of low-paying jobs. It's a thread that's throughout Loach's filmography. His look at the dark side of Thatcherism from the point of view of the common man in looks and smiles brought the Warwickshire native the Con Special Jury Prize in 1981. I want that tape. What tape? The tape they found on Sullivan's body. Critics argue he brought a humane quality to the political movie genre, a specialty that made him appealing for moviegoers and a trait that distinguished him from other movie makers. He became a cinematic chronicler of the constantly changing political atmosphere within the United Kingdom in a series of globally acclaimed features. Hidden Agenda, a film about the threats faced by human rights lawyers and activists, was received as an honest and complex look at the IRA problem in England. You're in danger here. Loach may seem too fixated on class, but he says it stems from his belief that to understand life, one has to understand the class struggle in Britain. Take Carla's song, a movie about the increase of immigration in England during the 1990s. So where, where is it you come from? I've been told by my doctor that I'm not supposed to go back to work yet. And more recently, he condemned the current status of British bureaucracy in I, Daniel Blake about a man who runs out of options to make a living. I was a carpenter. I've never been anywhere near a computer. So you need to run the mouse up the screen. <laughs> How does your company get away with this? And with Sorry We Missed You, Loach continues that theme, one that has lasted throughout his 50-year career, which might say a lot about the state of the British economy. You up for that? Yeah. Claire Monk joins me now. She is a film critic and scholar specializing in British cinema. Thank you so much for coming on our show today. I really appreciate it. So, I mean, Ken Loach is, is a phenomenon. He's 83. He's still a prolific filmmaker who's dedicated to tackle the issues that he finds important. But my question is, do you feel like he's repeating himself sometimes? Or uh, is, it the British, is it the state of British society that is making these movies relevant and important and even necessary? Well, firstly, Loach has never made films solely in the UK. It's worth remembering that there is a balance between his international films and historical films such as Land and Freedom, which he made about the Spanish Civil War and so on. But to answer your question about repetition, I don't think that he does repeat himself, actually. Um, I am going to talk or comment mainly on the 
English films that deal with working class people in the world of work and sometimes the benefit system in the UK. And I think if you look at that string of films, it would be better to say that there is there's a consistent there are a consistent set of political concerns um, and a consistent kind of political analysis of the situations and the great struggles and difficulties really facing ordinary working people in Britain that have existed um, certainly since the turn of mil the millennium, arguably longer than that, um, under a particular form of neoliberalism um, in the UK, but not only in the UK. And I think what's interesting is if you look at rather than repetition, there are consistent themes but different specific issues. Um, so that if you go right back to around 2000 or so when he made Bread and Roses, he was interested in the unionization of um, Latina cleaners and janitors in Los Angeles, for example. Mm -hmm. um, you know, Loach is interested in individuals' experiences of work under conditions that do not serve the ordinary working people at the coalface particularly well. Um, and, you know, in, Dan in I, Daniel Blake, a few years ago, you've got the exploration of the way Britain's disability and sickness benefit system absolutely lets people down. It's not about people who are not trying to work. It's about a guy who wants to work but has been signed off work following a heart attack mm -hmm. and how the bureaucracy of the benefit system itself, near, you know, ultimately kills him. Mm -hmm. um, and the new, you know, Loach's new film, I think, is looking at a separate issue again. So I don't think that these are repetition. I think it's a set of social concerns and concerns with the experiences of ordinary people navigating yeah. what a very bureaucratic system. So Claire, really. actually, I really like where you uh, brought us to because uh, the experience of the ordin ordinary people. I mean, social realist cinema uh, in the UK. Something has always bothered me about this. And I, now that I have you here, I'm just going to throw it at you. I mean, Ken Loach is not an ordinary person, is he? He is now a, an accomplished, well-off director. So do you think he can really tell the stories of poor people, people uh, living under austerity well? I mean, considering his movies are consumed by middle class mostly. I don't know who consumes Loach, Loach's movies, actually, but it is striking that when he makes them, he always... The, all the recent movies about ordinary people are based on real experiences and you know real life cases actually and it's very interesting how Loach always has the support of those ordinary people the people directly affected by the cases when he goes to promote the films I think also it's very easy to lay that charge of if you like success remoteness being part of the film industry at any director and there are numerous examples of people working in Britain and probably in other countries as well making films that are within the social realist spectrum which itself is a really broad and complex spectrum of types of filmmaking that's evolved quite a lot since the 1980s in all sorts of different directions and I think it's always possible to throw out that charge that the people making the films about quote-unquote ordinary people are somehow remote from ordinary experience and I think of all those directors Ken Loach it's, it's probably the person it's least fair to say that about mm -hmm. um, because Loach and his screenwriting partner on most of the recent films Paul Laverty work very very closely with and I mean to make Sorry We Missed You they interviewed I think hundreds of delivery workers um, who are you know ostensibly self-employed working in the gig economy they interviewed they spoke to loads of people to make and script this film. So I don't think you can really say he's out of touch with those experiences, no. I mean, it certainly was interesting to see, um, if, I suppose, the contrast between seeing Loach and sometimes his stars on the Crosette at Cannes and other big film festivals and what the films are about. But I think that's true. That that contrast is going to be true for any filmmaker who works with social subjects. Exactly. That's That, that was actually my point. Do you feel like... Ken Loach has a blind spot when it comes to gendered representations of the working class. For example, one critic says that a lack of female characters, he has a lack of female characters who are not simply love interests for the male characters. Well, firstly, he doesn't have a lack of female characters who are not simply love interest. So I think what can be said about Loach is that his notion of male and female roles and the family is quite traditional. Mm -hmm. We don't tend to get many gay characters in his films, for example. And I think the, no, you know, the notion of family you've got in Sorry We Missed You, it's a lot of a concern of Loach's recent films is exactly about how um, forms of precarious work and the gig economy affect, um, you know, affect the family, if you yeah. like. And the family is conceived in quite a conventional 
way. Okay, Claire Monk, thank you so much for joining us on Showcase today. And thank you very much, it's been a pleasure. Edward Norton's directorial debut, Keeping the Faith, brought a fresh perspective to romantic comedies. Now, with his sophomore effort, Motherless Brooklyn, he takes on film noir. So, can he give new life to this once hugely popular, yet now forgotten, 1940s genre? Let's take a look. I get something wrong with me. That's the first thing to know. I get threads in my head. In Motherless Brooklyn, Actor Edward Norton chooses to tell the old-fashioned story of a 1950s privatai, out to solve the conspiracy surrounding the death of his mentor. With its murder mystery plot, its dystopian urban setting, and Fedora longcoat-wearing detectives, the film's a throwback to the film noir. Can I help you, sir? Oh, yeah, I'm looking for a good mystery on something off the beaten track like the Maldives Falcon. Film noir was a popular type of crime film that had its heyday during the 1940s. Such films provided moviegoers with a different type of entertainment. They were intrigue-ridden pulp stories, but today they're recognized as sophisticated pieces of filmmaking. He gave me a place in Unlike the classic film noirs of yesterday, Motherless Brooklyn weaves a complex story, which finds Norton investigate through a corrupt New York, where the administration is doing its worst, to evict black citizens for redevelopment. The director admits he is driven by a longing for such movies with complex narratives. I promise you that. To me, the, the, the great tradition of these, <clears throat> these kinds of films, Chinatown or LA Confidential, is it's like by looking back, we can have the romantic experience of going back to another era and, and kind of the hypnosis and the drift of that. That's her. That's the girl that Frank was following. I think she found Despite something. its nostalgia, however, Norton's offering addresses contemporary social issues like gentrification and racism. This town is run by Moses Randolph. Gentrification is one thing, but I think that I, I always find it really perverse today. When, let's say you have the Black Lives Matter movement, you, you have people saying, hey, we have a systemic problem here of the devaluation of people, you know, and you, ha you see it in the, on the immigration d debates and conversation too. And this isn't about like, you know, is the socioeconomic fabric of a, of a community kind of changing because the markets are changing and people are expanding. We're talking about systemic things. If you threaten his work, he will destroy With its socially conscious angle, Motherless Brooklyn brings a fresh perspective to the film noir. You're webbed up in this somehow, and these people aren't going to stop. And due to this accomplishment, it has been dubbed by media as the most original film that rises above the standard movie fare in town at the moment. What don't I know? It might be early to do your holiday shopping, but that doesn't mean the big sales haven't begun for art lovers. And while Andy Warhol's portrait of Muhammad Ali and Mark Rothko's Blue Over Red aren't on mall shelves, you can now find them on the auctioning block in New York. Imagine this, an original Picasso hanging in your living room or a Hockney print greeting guests in your foyer. Sounds like a dream, doesn't it? Well, some wealthy art lovers will be lucky enough to live that dream with both Sotheby's and Christie's auction houses offering rare paintings and sculptures by the world's most renowned artists this month. Works by legends, including Monet and Picasso, are going under the hammer and expected to sell for top dollar. Like this piece, painted by Mark Rothko and titled Blue Over Red, it's estimated to sell for as much as $35 million. Organizers say the reason why is a kind of artistic magic. 
between 1950 and 1955 is considered the golden years of Mark Rothko. So to have a penny on canvas by him, um, coming from the diamond collection is pretty, is pretty special. Um, this is a rare composition because it doesn't always mix cold and, 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 um, and hot colors. And to have blues and pinks and oranges in the same composition is pretty rare. This is a, as silent, as figurative, as abstract as it could be. And at the same time, that's the magic of Rothko. You can so much feel emotions and landscapes and either sundown or sunset. This is a, someone able to say so much with so little. And that's the Rothko magic. David Hockney's very first painting of this particular moment at a California swimming pool has a pre-sale estimate of between six and eight million dollars. While contemporary work should see a big return on its value, impressionist artwork like Monet's chair in Crossbridge is expected to take the lead at this month's auctions. This fascination with the, the fleeting moment is epitomized with this late afternoon picture where the, the, the fog is rolling in. And he's also not only commenting about the, the, the light of day in London, but also the industrial age where he's included the, the plumes of steam which are rising over the bridge. Making the word a key element, Rusha's painting, Hurting the Bird Radio No. 2, from 1964, is among 61 lots of items on the block. And now, all that's needed is for art lovers to patiently wait for the chance to bid on their beloved items. Vasily Poleno is best known for his landscape paintings, with the Russian's peers in the late 19th, early 20th centuries calling him the Knight of Beauty, as he incorporated European and Russian traditions in his work. Now he's getting a career retrospective in Moscow. Vasily Polyanov's vision was simple. Art should promote happiness and joy. And now, for the first time in 25 years, a large retrospective of the Russian painter is taking place at Moscow's Tretyakov Gallery. The view from his backyard depicts what Moscow looked like 140 years ago. A bold move at the time because until the end of the 19th century, exhibitions did not accept work that might seem insignificant and not complicated enough. So such a painting was not easily taken seriously beyond the artist's workshop and a triumph in its days. Polano apologized and promised that in the future he would please the audience with something more outstanding. But to his amazement, Moscow Courtyard was accepted. The picture seemed very fresh to everyone. It was new, it was charming. Polanov himself was embarrassed by the success of his Moscow Courtyard. This is when the artist realized landscapes may be his calling over big historical paintings. It was a turning point for Polano himself and for Russian art in general. To understand that, it's not necessary to do huge paintings. Art does not have to live in colossal canvases. The picture may be small, but it still gives a lot to the audience. Polyanov avoided tragic topics, but his life was full of losses and misfortunes. At 28, his first love died. Later, his twin sister passed away. Polyanov battled depression, which doctors at the time called melancholy and hypochondria. He poured his feelings into his painting, A Sick Girl, some of the saddest and darkest colors seen in his work. The 19th century was a time of romanticism. The culture was focused on romanticism, but his painting is more musical. He was very musical, wrote operas, oratorios, romance songs. Here he takes the chords of light and darkness, which are struggling in the color of the painting. The only large-scale work of Polyanov is his monumental religious painting, Christ and the Sinner, which took 15 years to finish. This painting has come to Moscow for the first time in 131 years, on loan from the Russian Museum in St. Petersburg. For Polano, Christ was a real person, a preacher, a young man, the teacher of goodness and truth. 
We see that there is no halo above the head of Christ. He does not emphasize the divine essence of Christ. For him, the human hypostasis of Christ is more interesting and important to portray. The Pollyanna retrospective runs until mid-February and features more than 150 works from 16 Russian museums and private collections. Well, the Louvre is also hosting a retrospective on one of its most famous artists, Leonardo da Vinci. It coincides with the 500th anniversary of his death. And while da Vinci's most famous portrait, the Mona Lisa, is famously housed at the museum, curators there made the extraordinary effort to bring together other paintings by the artist on a scale never seen before. Already home to five Leonardo da Vinci paintings, more than any other institution or gallery, the Louvre has temporarily added another 160 da Vinci works to its collection. This retrospective was a decade in the making and displays works on loan from some high-profile lenders. Alors, les œuvres de Leonardo da Vinci elles sont aujourd'hui dispersées dans le monde entier. So, Leonardo da Vinci's works are now scattered all over the world. And for those who possess them, it really is a treasure that's difficult to be parted from. Fortunately, there were many very generous people, including the Bill Gates Foundation, the Queen of England, among others. Some of the works are by the famed Italian artist himself, while others are there to put the Italian maestro's work into context, like this Christ and St. Thomas sculpture by Andrea del Verrocchio. We wanted to open the exhibition with one of the most famous, most beautiful sculptures of the Florentine Renaissance, St. Thomas and the Christ, by Andrea del Verrocchio, Leonardo's master. And we wanted to show that Leonardo's painting had somehow been inspired out of this sculpture. Visitors will also get a glimpse of da Vinci's working methods through infrared imaging of his paintings, revealing the layers of toil and paint that lie underneath. I think the public will be very sensitive to icons. The Belle Ferronniere is one of them, since it is really the poster for the exhibition. There is a great curiosity to see also a drawing that is Leonardo da Vinci's icon, the Vitruvian Man, which is never shown because it's a fragile drawing. Nobody even knows where it is. In fact, it's kept at the galleries of the Academy in Venice and it will be presented for the first time in France. La peinture reste. Painting remains at the center of his life and it is painting that makes it whole. He considered painting as a science, as the queen of sciences, as involving all sciences, and even as a divine science, because it was capable of recreating the world, and that is what we wanted to show. Da Vinci's most renowned work, the Mona Lisa, is viewed by about 30,000 visitors daily. While under the same roof, it will not be moved to join this exhibition. The Louvre's Da Vinci retrospective runs until February, with half a million visitors expected. That's it on this episode of Showcase with me, Elif Bereketli. Head to our YouTube channel for more from the world of culture and the arts. But before we leave, let's stop in Berlin. This week is the anniversary of the fall of the Berlin Wall, and the German capital has become one large open-air exhibition. Take a look. Most of my pieces have been very abstract or, or sort of iconic in a very different way, but not um, message driven. And this was something I felt very strongly that we needed to put messages on there, that we needed to make it a, a collaborative experience with everybody because it took 
everyone to tear the wall down.